Awesome. Well, my name's Derek. If I haven't met you, welcome uh, to our church. I'm glad you're here. Uh, it's good to see you and uh, to worship with you and to uh, teach this morning. I'm uh, really excited about this one, so I'm just going to jump right in, all right? Uh, we're in Mark chapter 2, and, uh, and we're going to actually finish Mark chapter 2 today and even creep into Mark chapter 3. And, uh, and so, uh, if you will, just go there. You can grab your Bible journal. It's somewhere close by, or your Bible, whatever works for you, and, and turn over to Mark chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 18. All right, start in verse 18. It says this, Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and people came and said to him, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, can the wedding guest fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The day will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine in old wineskins. If he does, the, new, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is destroyed, and so are the skins, but new wine is for fresh wineskins. Now, let's, let's just stop and take this section uh, real quick before we continue. Um, this is, you know, Jesus is asked, like, why, why aren't your disciples fasting? Um, it would seem that on this particular day, we don't know what day it was, but on this particular day, it would have been Jewish custom to fast. Um, the Pharisees' disciples are fasting. John's disciples are fasting. So it would have been like likely that devout Jews would have been fasting. And uh, I want to be clear that Jesus' answer is not a condemnation of fasting or a, a declaration that fasting doesn't have good m like meaning or even have significant benefits. We know from Jesus' life himself that he practiced fasting and that it brought about benefit and strengthened the spirit and, and led him to like endure temptation from the evil one. So we know that like, like fasting is not something that Jesus would condemn. However, um, his answer is very deep. Deep and very significant uh, as we look closely at it because he's trying to actually communicate a clear message to these people by his answer. And so we should always pay attention to that. So we're going to start at the end where Jesus ends this section and we're going to work our way back up to the top. All right. So the first thing, he, the, the, the last thing that he mentions is this idea of new uh, and old wineskins. And my guess is no matter how much of a wine connoisseur some of you guys might be, none of you have drank and wine out of a wineskin. And is that fair to say? Uh, so I uh, <laughs> Okay, all right, one, one person, one person, uh, because he's a Neanderthal. All right, um, and uh, so uh, the, the idea is, is that like wine, put, like new wine put in old wineskins would have busted the wineskins. Uh, from what I've been told, and I, I'm, I'm not a wine connoisseur, I've had wine like literally maybe three or four times in my life, and uh, two of those times uh, I almost threw up as soon as it tasted it, and then... And then one of those times, it was, like, really expensive, and so I loved it. Uh, and, and so I will drink wine with you as long as you promise to spend a minimum of $1,000 on a bottle, all right? <laughs> uh, and so, uh, so anyway, the, the reality is, is that, like, I, uh, I, I don't know a whole lot about this, but from what I've read and from the research that I've done, even if you were to put new wine in an old wine bottle, it would bust the wine bottle. Um, and so wine has to be, new wine has to be put in new wine bottles and then aged over time in order for it to uh, really be properly cared for and taken care of. And, um, and what Jesus is trying to help his counterparts understand in this is that he is doing a new thing. What he is about and what he is here to bring about is a new thing, and it's not going to fit into these old ways that they've experienced before. This new wine that he's bringing about is going to shake and rattle the taste buds of people, um, and, and it's going to be even difficult for them to even see it as wine because it's going to taste sweeter and better than anything they've ever experienced. And so this new wine is something different. It's something amazing when it touches and graces your lips. 
But just before he talks about this idea of wine, he talks about this idea of patching up an old cloak or an old piece of cloth. And he says, you would never do that with an unshrunk piece of cloth because if then you washed it and it began to shrink, it would actually tear away from the garment and make a bigger problem, a bigger mess. Now, if you think about, like, if you want to put categories on new and old as good or bad, uh, you're going to miss this analogy, right? Because in this analogy, it's this idea that, like, you would ultimately think, like, if you put, like, those categories on those things, you'd be like, oh, so the new thing is the bad thing? If you're reading this. So that's why you can't do that. What, what Jesus is trying to help us see and what Jesus is trying to help us understand is that old and new are neither good nor bad. They just don't mix. They don't fit together. And, and when you try and, and make them fit together, it's going to cause a bigger problem than you already have. And so they don't fit nicely, especially when the old way of doing things isn't God's way of doing things. And the new thing isn't going to mix with that old establishment, even though it is kind of cut from the same cloth, so to speak. So this is a kind of interesting idea that Jesus proposes. He first begins uh, this with a talking about a wedding. He talks about uh, that you don't fast uh, at a wedding. It's basically what he's getting at by talking about the bridegroom. Uh, and Lent, uh, and the season of Lent is coming up. If you guys don't know, the season of Lent is coming up. Ash Wednesday is actually Valentine's Day. It's a very weird juxtaposition in America. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, so, but Ash Wednesday begins on Valentine's Day this year, and it's coming up. But in Lent, it's, it's a common practice that people don't have weddings or throw weddings um, throughout the week or on a weekday. They throw weddings on Sundays. And the reason why is because Sundays are not considered a day of fasting during Lent. During Lent, Sundays are a day for celebration because we have been freed from our sins because of Jesus, because of his death. That's why we're all here today, right? It isn't because you love me. It's because you love Jesus and because he died on the cross for your sins. And, and, and you're celebrating that goodness. You're celebrating his grace. That's why we come here on the first day of the week and we, ce we celebrate him. That's what this is about. And so when you're going through Lent, Sunday is not a fast day because it's a day of celebration, which means it's a day of feasting, not a day of fasting. And so, and so what, what is beginning to take place in, uh, is very similar in Jesus' mind. What he is expressing and what he is proclaiming is that the reason why the Jews are likely fasting is because they're looking back into the past. They're looking back into their past old life, and they're looking at ways in which they went wayward. They're looking at ways in which they failed. They're looking at ways in which their shortcomings um, caused issues and problems. And so they're fasting as an act of repentance or as an act of remembering that, of mourning that, whatever it might be, right? And that's not a bad practice, okay? That's not a bad practice. Jesus is just trying to say, like, I'm doing away with all that old stuff. I've come, and because I'm here, I'm taking care of all the old failures. I'm taking care of all the old sin. I'm taking care of all the old ways in which you failed and separated yourself from God. I'm reuniting you to God in myself. This is no reason to fast. It's a reason to celebrate. And that's why he and his disciples didn't fast. It's because he, he had come. He had come to restore those things that were broken in the past. And so he's saying, this isn't a season to fast, this is a season to celebrate. Because what I have come to do is to restore that past and make it new. And it's just a really, really beautiful, beautiful thing. You lay those three things on top of each other, it's like, wow, this is, this is pretty, pretty awesome um, when, you, when you think about it, when you consider it. And so uh, I just, I want to encourage us that, like, there is a time to fast. And Lent is a great time to fast. And even as a church, we're going to encourage you to even, like, let's practice that together. We're going to try and practice what it would mean to fast together. But on Sundays, just like we do every Sunday, we're going to celebrate. And we're going to feast. And we're going to, we're going to, we're going to worship God because he is, he is worthy of praise. He is worthy of glory and honor and majesty. And, and it's a time to celebrate, not a time to fast. But it is, it's not a bad practice. To, to, to think about uh, your sins and mourn over your sins and, and, and fast and trying to uh, strengthen your spirit uh, within. 
But we should not lose sight that with Jesus, we are born again, and we are new creations, and the old is gone, and the new has come. We should never lose sight of that, and we should never lose sight of the fact that when he shows up, that's what happens. And so we should celebrate that uh, as much and much as we can, right? Because we have a hope, and we have a future that looks very bright because of Jesus. Amen? All right, let's keep reading. Uh, Verse 23 says, one Sabbath... He was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, look, why are they doing what is unlawful or what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, have you never read what David did when when he was in need and was hungry? He and those that were with them, how they entered the house of God in a time of Abathar, the high priest, and ate the bread of the presence, which was not lawful for anyone but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. And he said to them, the Sabbath was not made for man, or was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Again, he entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand, and they watched him, they watched Jesus, to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath, and so they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, come here, and said to them, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? But they were silent, and he looked around At them with anger and grieved at the hardness of their hearts, and said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. And the Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. Now, here's a couple things, right? These these instances, uh, or or what, what Jesus is talking about here, is another ancient Jewish practice. Uh, called Sabbath. And the first is this meal that is wrought with defiance, and the second is this healing that is wrought with purpose. And so I, I think it's really interesting thing that in the first story, it comes right after people complaining about Jesus' disciples not fasting, but like they're hungry. Um, and on the Sabbath, they're hungry, and they begin to pick grain, and they begin to eat it, and uh, because they're hungry. Now, it was, it was likely that Jesus' disciples didn't maybe keep the traditional Jewish customary days of fasting, but likely that they went many days without food because they were nomads, for, for, for lack of a better term, and they relied on the charity of other people in order to have food and eat and all of these other kinds of things. And so they're walking through the grain field, probably haven't eaten in a while, and they're hungry, so they start to pick grain off and they begin to eat. Um, and, and, um, and so I just, I find it interesting that like, um, because they didn't do it at the right time or, you know, whatever, it, 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 it became this big issue. As opposed to like, they lived a life where they went without very much of the time. But the most interesting thing I find here is the things that Jesus says about why Sabbath exists at all and how his declaration of being Lord of the Sabbath makes all the difference in the world for you and me. Now, if you don't know, the Sabbath was one of the Ten Commandments. It's actually the longest one of the Ten Commandments. If you go and read the Ten Commandments, it's the longest one. Uh, And... um, and he, it, it, was, it was built into the fabric of God's creation. And we're going to talk more about that here in just a minute. But Jesus says here, he says, Man was not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath was made for man. So let me tell you what this does not mean. It does not mean that the Sabbath isn't important or, or that it shouldn't be adhered to. It isn't uh, Jesus saying that like it, the, the Sabbath has no value or we shouldn't be trying to engage in it, okay? That is not what he's saying. In fact, it's actually the exact opposite of what he's saying. What Jesus is saying is that the Sabbath was never meant to be something men went about trying to serve. Jesus is saying that the Sabbath was meant to serve us. We weren't meant to serve it. Sabbath, in other words, was a gift. 
It was a gift to us from God that we might be able to enter into his rest and his beauty and his delight and his rhythm and his hope and his love and his peace. That's what Sabbath was meant to be. God gave it to his people because he loved them and he desired them to look different than the rest of the world. And as they began to live in a world where day after day after day, everyone was grinding to make ends meet or, or grow their life or make their life better by hard work, he says, you will be different because you will take a day of rest. I'm giving you a day. I'm going to provide enough for you so that you can take a day of rest. It was a way of making them his people and no one else's. To show that he actually owned them and took care of them, no one else did. It was this beautiful foundation um, of a nation who spent hundreds of years in captivity. And he said, you don't have to now build bricks in order to appease me or make me happy. You don't have to accomplish anything, in fact. You can just rest for a day and I'll make sure everything else keeps going without you having to work too hard. It's a really beautiful gift. But what had happened was that the religious elite and the teachers of the law turned Sabbath into a rule to be followed as opposed to a gift to be enjoyed. And it became an oppressive and legalistic thing as opposed to providing freedom. Now, let me explain legalism for just a second, the way that I look at it from the New Testament. Legalism in the New Testament is, in my mind, what Jesus says when he says, you heap up heavy burdens on people without lifting a finger to help. That's legalism. What Jesus does is he is going to have rules, if you haven't figured it out. He gives his people ways to follow him and ways to walk with him and calls them to live a certain kind of life. But what he does is he comes and lives that life he calls them to live and shows them how to do it and invites them to do it with him. And he is lifting that burden from their shoulders. That's what he's saying when he says in Matthew 11, come to me, come to me, and I'll show you how to take a real rest and yoke yourself to me. And I'll show you how to live freely and lightly. That's what Jesus is saying in Matthew 11 when he says that. He's saying, like, I am, I'm not going, I'm going to, I'm going to, there's a way to live life. (laughs) I'm going to show you that way. But I'm also going to help you live that way. Which is very different than legalism. And it's important to note that, that also that Jesus, uh, he talks about David. He tells a story about David. And when you go back and you look at this story of David, uh, it was a time in which David uh, entered into, you know, God's house, the temple or tabernacle, and, and went and got bread that was set apart only for the priests. And he, him and his companions ate it because they were hungry. Uh, it says, it's interesting because David was anointed as king at this point, but he hadn't actually taken the throne yet. And so what Jesus is pointing to and what he's saying is like, guys, I'm kind of the king here. I don't know if you know, but like, I'm the king. I've been anointed. I just might not have taken my throne yet. But you're going to see. You're going to see. I'm going to have the final say because I am Lord of the Sabbath. It's a really, really neat thing. But it also, I love that this is tied with another story at the beginning of chapter 3. It talks about Sabbath and shows us that Jesus does his best work on the Sabbath. He does his best work on the Sabbath. Uh, and I'm going to tell you why he does his best work on the Sabbath. But in order to do that, I've got to take you from Genesis to maps. So we're going we're gonna to go. We're going to go on a whole journey this morning. Y'all excited? All right, so here we go. So Genesis 1, verse 31 through 2, 3, it says, God saw all that he made, and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning on the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were created in all their vast array. And by the seventh day, God had finished the work that he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested. From all this, all of his work, and then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Now, if you, I want you to follow along, okay? 
On the seventh day, God creates Sabbath. Uh, he rests. This word Sabbath, or this word rest, or um, is is the word Shabbat in Hebrew. It means to stop, to cease, or to rest. That's what it means. Um, and so he he rested on that day, and this is where we get our term Sabbath. Now. Uh, there's a lot that I can draw out of this, but in order for me to do all that, you'd have to come to the Sabbath class, and I just ended it today. So, uh, so it's 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 not no more, at least for a little while, and then uh, I'll teach it again, I'm sure. But um, but I want you to notice: Do you notice that there is an omission in in the seventh day that's not there in all of the other days of creation? That on day one through six, at the end of the day. It says that there was evening and there was morning on the first day. And there was evening and there was morning on the second day. And there was evening and there was morning on the third and so forth and so on. It even says it about the sixth day at the beginning of this passage. But on the seventh day, there's no mention of evening or morning. It's a really interesting change in this creation narrative. It's a really strange thing. All right? Let's, let's follow along, though. We'll come back to this. So... The, the number seven is a very significant number in Jewish culture and Jewish history and, and in the Bible. And uh, the number seven, what it, what it really uh, denotes is completeness or perfection. That's the idea behind the number seven. And so the fact that Sabbath comes on the seventh day is significant because it's tied to completeness and perfection. It's, it's tied to what happens when all is right in the world. It's really pretty and really beautiful to think of it in that way. But there are also other significant sevens that we come in contact with, especially throughout the Old Testament. The, the, the seventh year, if you don't know, uh, was a year of rest. So not only did the Jewish people get uh, every seven days, they get a day of rest, but every seventh year, they got an entire year off. They got an entire year to rest. And they let the ground rest, and they let their, they let their oxen, and they let their, uh, their, their livestock rest. They let their slaves rest, and they rested for an entire year. It was this beautiful way of God building in and commanding them to build in justice and peace and love for all that he created. Animals, land, and human beings all alike. Now... You go to now where you get this happens uh, multiple times, right? So the seventh time, the seventh time you get to the seventh year, that's the 49th year, and you get your day of rest. But instead of heading back to work in year 50, year 50, you got an additional year of rest. I mean, it's like, what in the world is going on? Well, in the 50th year, this is really, really cool. In the 50th year, it was called the year of Jubilee. And in the year of Jubilee, if you owed a debt to somebody, it was forgiven. If you were a slave to someone, you were set free. If you were, were in any way oppressed, you were, that oppression was lifted. It was this beautiful way of, of, of bringing everyone to a level playing field in God's eyes. Beautiful way of bringing justice and beauty to all the world and all of humanity, all of creation. But you had to live in accordance with this rhythm in order to experience the year of Jubilee. Now, let's fast forward, all right? We're going to, you know, flip all the pages that are left in the rest of, you know, the Old Testament. We're going to go to Luke chapter 4, where this happens. It says, then he went to Nazareth. When he had been, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day, this is Jesus, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom, he stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me. Now the key point about this is in Luke chapter 4, he is, he is baptized um, just before this instance, and he is anointed by the Spirit of God as he comes out of the water. So this, this verse that he is, he is declaring as his mission of why he has come, it, he has been anointed to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoner and recovery of sight to the blind and to set the oppressed free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, what is the year of the Lord's favor? It's Jubilee. 
That's the year of the Lord's favor where everyone who is oppressed is set free. And you look at the progression of this story. You look at the progression of Luke chapter 4, and he says, He's anointed me to give good news to the poor. What happened if you owed a debt? What happened if you were down on your luck financially? You were forgiven. (laughs) What happened if you were oppressed and you were a prisoner or you were a slave? You were set free. So what is Jesus proclaiming on the Sabbath in Nazareth what he is here to do? He's here to bring about Jubilee. That's what he's saying. I've I've come to bring this Jubilee to the world. Now, think about where he's at now in Mark chapter 3, right? The story we just looked at today, where a guy with a withered hand is sitting there oppressed by this condition. And people are just letting him sit there oppressed by this condition and think it's unlawful to do anything about this condition. And Jesus says, unshrivel your hand. And he does. What is he doing? He's setting that guy free. He's actually doing what Sabbath was meant to do on the Sabbath. He's proclaiming the truth of what Sabbath is intended for on the Sabbath. To set you free from whatever ails you, from whatever oppresses you from whatever holds you down. That's that's, that's what he's going about doing. And so many, many times throughout the Gospels, you will see Jesus go in somewhere on the Sabbath and he'll perform a miracle and he'll do his best work on the Sabbath. And it's because his, his Sabbath work is to set us free. His Sabbath work is to, to, to lift the oppression. That's what it's intended to be. That's what it's intended for. It's not something legalistic. It's something beautiful. It's something beautiful to live in and delight in and worship God in because he's setting us free. But let me just say, as cool as all of that stuff is, and it's cool. I, I don't know about you. It, that's, that's cool. I told you I'd take you to the map, so we're going to go all the way to Revelation now. The end of Revelation, Revelation 21, and this for me is like the boom, like this just, wow, when I, when I realized this for the first time, I was like, like lights, light bulbs went off, my head exploded, all the stuff, you know. Revelation 21, 1 through 5, this is a vision from the Apostle John, it's revelation, it's a vision, it's not revelations, it's one vision, and, and you may have, you know, be familiar with this if you've grown up around the church, you may have heard these words before, but. Revelation 21, 1 through 5, it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eye, and there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. What do we start today talking about? How Jesus is taking and he's doing away with the old order and the new order of things. His new thing that he wants to do is starting to take place. Then he says, he who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. Skip down to verse 23. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. So... Here we have this scene of the new heavens and the new earth and the, the God is bringing and making all things new and has made all things new and it's this dwelling place where God is with his people and his people are with him and it's jubilee. It is no more mourning. It is no more pain. It is no more sorrow or sadness. But do you notice what happens at the end? There is no need for the sun or the moon. It's very interesting. 
These were the lights that God created in Genesis chapter 1 to govern the day and the night. We don't need them anymore. And there's no more night there because it never ends. Genesis 1 seems to paint a picture that day 7 never ends. It seems to be showing us that what all creation is headed toward is eternal Sabbath and eternal Jubilee. And if you look at the things in the way that Jesus looks at things and the things he does on Sabbath, the freedom and the healing that he provides, that is what eternity is going to be like for you and for me where there is no more death or pain or sorrow, where the work that we do will be a delight and bring justice and joy into the world and freedom for those who experience it. When we look at Sabbath in this way, here's, here's what I want you to see. I want you to see what Jesus sees. That is what Jesus is trying to get us to see by how he lives and how he walks and how he adheres to the Sabbath. See, the reality is, is that I really do believe in Sabbath. And I believe that we need and we should take a day and set it apart for God to Sabbath. Because when we do, if we, if we do, what we are reminding ourselves is this is our eternity. Eternal rest, eternal freedom, eternal hope, eternal life. When we take one day a week and we set it aside, we embrace the rhythm of God and what he's leading us toward in heaven. We embrace and we worship God in the beauty of his garden. If we make it something legalistic or an endeavor to be adhered to because it's commanded or because it's talked about in the Bible, we miss the point. Like, we miss the point. But we do it because it's a gift of eternal life. And maybe more than ever before in human history, we need this gift. In a digital world, in a digital age where your phone is constantly buzzing in your pocket and there's always emails to send seven days a week, like we thought technology was going to make us work less and it causes us to work more. What if, we, what if we just said, no, I'm not going to live in, in, in the patterns of the world, but I'm going to change. I'm going to be different. I'm going to embrace this practice of Sabbath rest, and I'm going to taste a little slice of heaven every week. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing, but it's often neglected and discarded by our culture. We need to embrace it because all of the pushback that Jesus gives about Sabbath is actually pushback because it had become something it wasn't meant to be. He was trying to restore its place in the story. He's trying to restore its order that we were not meant to serve it, but it was meant to serve us. If you need a reminder of the beauty of God can I just say, use Sabbath as a day to get out in creation and just worship Him. If you need to be reminded that you aren't judged by your production or by your accomplishments, but you are only judged by the blood of Jesus that you plead over your life because of His death on the cross, praise God that we cannot earn or work hard enough to earn our salvation. It is a like we could just take that on Sabbath and just remember, like, oh, I can just rest in the fact I don't have to achieve anything. He just loves me. He forgives me. I can't earn this no matter how hard I work. That's, that's a reason to embrace and live in the rhythm of Sabbath. If you need to be reminded of the hope of heaven, 
And what a glorious day it will be when we see him face to face. And there is no more mourning. And there is no more pain. And there is no more sorrow. And we are living in this eternal jubilee of hope and life and freedom. May we embrace this rhythm of Sabbath. See, Sabbath can look any number of different ways. It doesn't have to be, oh, I'm not allowed to go to the grocery store, and I'm not allowed to do this, and I'm not. It's, it, 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 can, it can look a number of different ways. But if it's done right, if it's done right, it will always be heavenly. And it will always give us a small slice of eternity with our Lord. And so I just want to encourage you to embrace it, live in it, and walk in it as God intended us to, because it is a beautiful, beautiful gift to lift the burden, not make it more heavy. Amen? Let's pray. God, I thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy, and God, I just thank you so much that today, most of the days, uh, or, or the day that most of us would probably rest the most, the, most of the, the day where most of us will worship the most, the day where we give ourselves to you the most, um, God, I, I just praise you for this day, I praise you that today is a day where we can experience a small slice of heaven here on earth, and experience it here on earth if we just give ourselves to it, and what you intend it to be. God, may we take joy and delight in this day. May we worship and adore you this day. May we find the communion with all the saints to be a pleasure this day. God, may today just give us a small slice of heaven, our eternal home, because of you. Not because of anything we've done or any work that we've done, but because of the work that you've done and the beauty that you've brought to this world and to this creation. We praise you and love you. In Jesus' name, amen.